The reading is from Matthew chapter 2, and it's on page 966 of the Church Bible. Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Who is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star would appear. He sent to them to he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray for Helen at the beginning of this uh, uh, talk. Perhaps you'd like to stretch out your hands to bless her uh, and to pray for the Lord's blessing upon her as we come to this today. Lord, we pray that you will be with Helen today and with this word that she's prepared. Lord, we ask that you'll speak to us all powerfully today, that you'll challenge our hearts, that you'll feed us spiritually, Lord, that we may move forward with you we pray, Lord, that you will use this word today in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. I have to have a swiveling head when you're standing up here. So. <laughs> um, well, Happy New Year to you. We weren't here last week, so it's the first time I've had to, time, first opportunity I've had to wish you a Happy New Year. We were away for New Year with uh, Brendan's brother and his wife up in Cheshire. And we came back on Monday afternoon, and the first thing we did when we came back was clear away all the Christmas stuff before going back to work on Tuesday. And I don't know about you, but I find it a bit of a relief to get the house back to normal. So it comes as a bit of a shock to find that this morning's reading throws us right back into the center of the nativity scene. It's a bit like that advert for Jaws, isn't it? Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Well, this morning, it's just when you thought Christmas was over. Not quite yet, though, because today we remember the Feast of the Epiphany, as Glyn has said. It's actually celebrated on Friday. And before we start, I just want to let you know that we are cool and hip here at Christchurch. Apparently, hashtag Epiphany is trending on Twitter at the moment, whatever that means. So what does Epiphany mean? The dictionary definition says a moment of great revelation or realization. And here in the UK, mainstream Christian churches, we don't celebrate Epiphany in the same way as in other countries and in other Christian churches, except many mark it as the day when the decorations should finally be put away. 
Children are normally back at school and people are back at work. But for some, the season of Epiphany is another important celebration, particularly in continental Europe and in the Catholic and Orthodox churches. And it's celebrated 12 days after Christmas. Epiphany is normally the festival when people remember the visit of the wise men to Jesus in Bethlehem. But some Christians also remember the baptism of Jesus at this time. And there are many customs associated with the feast, and I thought it would be good just to, to go through what some of them are around the world. So here we go. Apologies to Carly and Nigel now, because in the Spanish-speaking world, Epiphany is known as Dia de los Reyes, Three Kings Day. And in Mexico, for instance, crowds gather to taste the rosca de reyes, that's the king's bread. In other countries, a Jesus figurine is hidden in the bread. In some European countries, children leave their shoes out the night before to be filled with gifts, while others leave straw out for the three king's horses, or camels. In Bulgaria, Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox priests throw a cross in the sea, and the men dive in, competing to get to it first. They are especially remembering Jesus' baptism. In Belgium, children dress up as the three wise men and go from door to door to sing songs, and people give them money or sweets, a bit like trick-or-treating here for Halloween. And children in Poland also go out singing on Epiphany. In New York, the museum, the El Museo de Barrio, has celebrated and promoted the Three Kings Day tradition with an annual parade for more than three decades. Thousands take part in the procession featuring camels, colorful puppets, and floats. And finally, and this is the best, so listen up, gentlemen. In Ireland, Epiphany is also called, and apologies to any Irish people here, Noligneman, or Women's Christmas. <laughs> Traditionally, the women get the day off, and men do the housework and cooking. Surprisingly, it is becoming more popular, and many Irish women now get together on the Sunday nearest Epiphany to have tea and cakes. Good, isn't it? We like that one. So those are some of the traditions, but there are also some myths associated with Epiphany. Firstly, and this is perpetuated by some of the carols we sing, there's a myth that there were three visitors from the East. The Bible doesn't say that, only that there were three gifts. We don't know how many visitors there were. Secondly, that the three visitors, that's already looking shaky, were called Melchior, Caspar, and Belshazzar. Thirdly, that they were kings. They may have been kings, but the Bible only says that they were wise men. And there's the then there's the legend that the three kings, three again, represented the continents of Europe, Arabia, and Africa. And interestingly, this comes from a list of facts about Epiphany. So what do we know about this strange event? Now, it seems really familiar to us. It's been part of our Christmas for years, but when you think about it, it is strange. What we really know only comes from the words that we've had read to us this morning from the Bible. So the facts are the visitors were called Magi, which translates as wise men, wise men, and they came from the east. They were following a star which they associated with the birth of the king of the Jews. Their mission was to find him and worship him. They stopped off in Jerusalem and had a meeting with Herod, who was alarmed at the news of another king, but sent them on their way to find him and report back. They followed the star until it led them to Jesus, where they worshipped him and presented their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They left by a different route after they'd been warned in a dream not to return to Herod. And that's it. They're not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. What we can deduce is that Jesus was probably not a newborn baby when they visited, but anything up to two years old, as later in the passage, Herod orders the killing of all babies under two. So even our nativity scenes, cards, plays, and films are not totally accurate. The wise men probably never even met the shepherds. So why is this strange story in the Bible? What does it teach us? <clears throat> Firstly, as I mentioned earlier, the definition of epiphany speaks about a moment of great revelation or realization. And in this context, it's the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles for the first time. 
The Jews may not have been very happy that their king was also, be, also to be saviour to the Gentiles, but this had been prophesied on a number of occasions many years before. There's a, um, a, a section in Isaiah 42 which says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. And that was speaking to Israel, but also looking forward to Jesus. And after Jesus was born, these words were echoed when he was first taken to the temple as a young child, and his parents came across Simeon, who said, and these words we use in a, in a prayer called the Nunc Dimittis, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. That's from Luke 2, if you want to look it up. <clears throat> So this is a really important moment in history. Almost as soon as Jesus is born, as Emmanuel, God with us, the Gentiles are included. And this is very good news for us. Although the Jews at the time would have found it very hard to swallow. Secondly, the wise men heard from God. He was speaking through nature, the star, and through dreams. It's possible that the wise men knew something of the Jewish expectation of a Messiah, as the Jews were exiled to Babylon, which was east of Judah, so we can perhaps see that they might have had some connection. But there is no sense that they were Jewish. So it's possible to encounter God, even though you don't fully understand all the theology or even who he is. In the first chapter of Romans, Paul says this, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So God wants everyone to know about him and hear from him, whether they can attend church or Sunday school or have never even heard of Jesus. Anyone who searches for him will find him. And this is encouraging today. God will make himself known to those who have no contact with Christians. And I know there are plenty of stories about Muslims who have encountered Jesus in their dreams. Thirdly, the wise men were determined. Tradition has it that the wise men came from Persia, and that's well over a thousand-mile journey. It would have taken them weeks or months through deserts, mountains, risking bandits. They were certainly on a mission to meet with Jesus. Fourthly, it was costly for them in time and money, and possibly in relationships and positions they'd left behind. And in addition, they brought expensive gifts with them. Then the wise men weren't taken in by fame or celebrity or status. They worshipped a poor baby lodging in an ordinary home rather than a rich king in a palace. You can imagine them getting there and maybe thinking, oh, what's all this then? No, this can't be right, and turning around and going back again. <clears throat> but they worshipped the poor baby. And they obeyed God, understanding that Jesus was in danger from Herod and returning home by a different route. And lastly, they brought appropriate gifts, gifts for a king, gifts fit for a king. And we'll look at this a little bit later on. So that's looking at the story of the wise men in a little bit more depth. But what does it say to us today? Firstly, the main purpose of the wise men's travels was to worship Jesus. It says, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. This was some journey to make to worship. It was sacrificial, and they were absolutely determined to do what they had set out to do. It was very important to them, even though they possibly didn't really realize who they were worshipping. But we are all created to worship God. It's at the very heart of our being, and the wise men were no different. How determined are we to ensure that we come to worship Jesus? On a Sunday morning, in our small groups, or at other events... We can worship on our own, but it's God's plan that we should worship together with other believers. 
Is it in our diary or our phone as a recurring event or a priority? Are we easily put off if a better offer comes along? Are we prepared to travel a bit or come out if it's cold or raining or if we're tired? The wise men set a great example of commitment and that's something that's becoming increasingly rare in today's society. <coughs> Pardon me. Secondly, they wanted to present Jesus with gifts, gifts which were appropriate for a king. And that's really the key of what I want to say. I think God wants to say this morning that the gifts were appropriate. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I read this description of the gifts, which will help us to see why they were appropriate. Firstly, gold. It's easy to see why gold is an appropriate gift for Jesus Christ. Gold is the metal of kings. When gold was presented to Jesus, it acknowledged his right to rule. The wise men knew Jesus was the king of kings. Incense. Incense was also a significant gift. It was used in the temple worship. It was mixed with the oil that was used to anoint the priests of Israel. It was part of the meal offerings that were offerings of thanksgiving and praise to God. And in presenting this gift, the wise men pointed to Christ as our great high priest, the one whose whole life was acceptable and well-pleasing to his father. <clears throat> myrrh. Myrrh was used for embalming. By any human measure, it would be odd, if not offensive, to present to the infant Christ a spice used for embalming. But it was not offensive in this case, nor was it odd. It was a gift of faith. We do not know precisely what the wise men may have known or guessed about Christ's ministry, but we do know that the Old Testament again and again foretold his suffering. <clears throat> So I wonder what Mary and Joseph thought of the gifts. They might not have understood their full significance, but they must have been in awe of the generosity of the wise men. And in addition, of course, Mary and Joseph have both been visited by an angel where they were made aware that the baby Mary was carrying was very special, and the gifts would have resonated with the words that the angel spoke. He said, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now we've just cleared up after Christmas, and I wonder how many of you have put away some inappropriate gifts to recycle to someone else. Now be honest. <laughs> We're thinking, well, I'm grateful, but why on earth did they think I would like that? But it wasn't like that for the baby Jesus. The gifts that the wise men brought were beautifully appropriate. We have gifts that we can bring to the King of Kings. Gifts of our time, our skills, and our money. Are the gifts that we bring appropriate? Are we bringing them sacrificially? Or are they half-hearted or bought grudgingly? With our money, are we giving appropriately? or just out of what we have left over? With our time, do we squeeze in church, small groups, praying and Bible reading, if there's nothing else on? Isn't it amazing how we can find time to play games on our phones, go to the gym, phone a friend or watch TV, and then say we're struggling to find a quiet time with God? And are we prepared to use our skills for the benefit of our local church, our brothers and sisters, or other Christian community, and for the glory of God. In 1 Peter, it says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. I just want to tell you about a friend of mine and what happened when she offered her gift to God. And this bit isn't in the notes. Um, it was quite a, a few years ago. She was in our home group at the time. She's about my age. She had two young boys at the time, but she didn't connect easily with young teenagers. And one day, we found ourselves praying for her. And a short while later, she, out of the blue, felt that she should help with Pathfinders, which was a group on a Sunday morning for, I think, about 11 to 14-year-olds. So she obeyed God, Sort of shrugged her shoulders and said, oh, okay then. And she found she had a new passion for young teenagers. 
She was a single parent. She worked full time, but effectively became the youth worker for the church, running groups on a Sunday morning and during the week. Now, as we look back now, we look at the fruit of that obedience from what she said was a pretty rubbish gift. She said she was pretty rubbish at it. Our daughter, Heather, is living a life of faith. There are others who are full-time Christian ministry who are in that group. There are others who are leading services. There are others who are speaking. There are others who are worship leaders. And a good proportion of that group of teenagers that she led are now living lives of faith. From this, from a woman who really didn't think much of teenagers at all. Um, it's quite amazing what can happen when you offer your gift to God. So the question for us is, do we know what our gifts are? Gifts can be given by God in a variety of ways. They can be our natural talents, which we then use for God's glory. So if you find it easy to relate to young children, then you can use that gift by helping out at Kids Church or Messy Church. If you're good at DIY, perhaps you could offer to help Steve with jobs around the church. They can be what we might term the spiritual gifts, such as gifts of prophecy or evangelism, given by God but for the building up of others, building up of the church. These can be for a one-time only use or, or for a season or part of a longer-term ministry. And they can be gifts which are just given, that are new gifts or passions given by God for a particular purpose, as with my friend. So the beginning of a new year is a good time to do a bit of an audit, checking to see if your gifts are appropriate to give to the king of kings, and maybe to make some resolutions. Is there a new way you could use your gifts to serve your church and community? And if you're not sure what your gifts are, then ask someone you trust to help you identify them. Then ask God where you could use them. Do you need to review your financial giving to the church? Do you need to adjust your diaries to give God the best of your time? Of course, the gift that the King of Kings most desires from us is our worship, our devotion, and our hearts. And let's make sure that at the end of 2017, we can join in with the words of the carol in the bleak midwinter, where it says, what can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were, were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him, give my heart. Amen. <laughs>